um, and we'll have a few things to say. So I hope this is a conversation. Uh, there's a large number of us in here, which makes it a little harder to have a conversation, but let's try to do that. Um, I don't have five or four or six points to make over the course of the next hour. Uh, those of you in my next class will get that the next three hours. So, uh, we will give you a break between this and that. Yeah, we're good. Uh, but let me start uh, just with a brief introductory statement. Um, the great photographer, Dorothy Lange, who photographed the Dust Bowl, and who photographed the Depression in America, you all probably know her photograph, Migrant Mother, a uh, picture of the mother in a tent in California with her two children huddled against her, uh, probably the most iconic photograph of the Dust Bowl. Uh, Dorothy Lange is famous for having said, quote, the camera is a tool for learning how to see without the camera. And I think she gets it right that, that so often um, photographers like myself become uh, camera experts. It's as though the instrument itself becomes an object or an end in itself. But what we're really, what we're really aiming for, I think, in the arts generally in photography, is that the camera is just an instrument to enable you to more faithfully live in the world, to see the world as God would have us see it and live in it. And so that really is kind of my theme. Uh, I do not offer courses in cameras. Uh, I offer courses in the spirituality of seeing. How is it that we can train ourselves to see the world more faithfully, to see it as, as Calvin talks about the world, as a theater of God's glory? Um, and in the history of, of Christianity and art in the West, uh, the two have intersected in a number of different places. Uh, the first is that very often in the Western tradition, art was, was, was used to depict Christian subject matter, right? Christian scenes. So you would look at stained glass windows, perhaps, or biblical scenes. Or you would look at photographs of explicitly religious subject matter. Uh, that's kind of one strand in the Western tradition. The other strand in the Western tradition is the attempt to incorporate arts into worship. And so we have kind of this intentional efforts to uh, integrate uh, beautiful, beautiful lyrics and beautiful uh, music into the hymnody of the life of the church. But there's another way of thinking about the connection between theology and arts, and that's the way I kind of focus my energy. And it's on, on asking, how do we see the world and live into the world faithfully as an act of Christian discipleship through the arts? So my work focuses less on how do I get photographs that I can use in worship, or how do I make photographs of subject matter that's explicitly religious. You'll notice that there is nothing uh, explicitly religious in the subject matter of this sequence of photographs. So for me, uh, the journey into seeing is just that. It's a journey into being open and receptive meeting the world as God would have me meet the world, coming to attend to it, to linger over the beauty that's there as an act of bearing witness uh, to the hand of God. I'm delighted in, in the mystery of the wonder of the world out there as it shows forth the majesty and the beauty of God. So that's my little uh, elevator speech as to kind of why or where I make the connection as a theologian and philosopher between these two forms. So let me just open it up um, for comments and questions. If there's an image, we have the 20 images that are up kind of strobing here. If there's one that you would like to talk about, uh, ask questions about, uh, we can do that. And then if we run into some dead spots, I have some things that I can read at you. Uh, but I would rather not. Yes, yeah, Shirley. I've noticed uh, in a lot of the things that you post on your Facebook page, you talk about uh, and Lately, anyway, you've taken some older photographs, come back, and then some some additional processing sure. while online. And I wonder, uh, to what extent do you think that that um, that process of uh, cropping and editing and adjusting helps you to to focus on those sort of theological themes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, all the way back to the beginning of photography's history, people have manipulated the image. And we often see an image on, the, on, the Facebook, on, on Facebook or the internet and say, oh, that was Photoshop. And often the times, it's so over the top that it, it kind of stretches beyond what is believable. And you say, that's so fake, it has to be Photoshopped, right? But uh, I think a more skillful hand of editing of photographers going back all the way to the 1840s is that many of the techniques that we do now digitally were hidden from the public because they happened in the sacred inner sanctum of the dark room, to which very few people had access to. So most of the things that we do digitally to manipulate, to crop, to adjust exposure, all of that used to be done in the dark room chemically. Now it's just more democratic and it's come out into the open um, uh, computer screen. 
But to get to your question, I think it's very important because my, my processing skills over the past 10 years have improved dramatically. Uh, what I can now do with an image is significantly better than it was five, seven, six, even three or four years ago, frankly. And I think that that's not just um, the acquisition of what I call, what in the Buddhist tradition they call little knowledge, small knowledge. The knowledge of how to manipulate things in a, in a kind of utilitarian way. It's in service of vision, a bigger way of, of focusing my viewer's attention on what I want my viewers to see. And to, the processing for me is always about removing distracting elements, more in a more refined way, focusing the viewer's attention on what I think is suggestive or provocative in an image, uh, and not, not trying to fake the image uh, by oversaturating it or by modifying the content of the image. It is for me in service of the question, how can just the way I process this image better focus my viewer's attention on what's really mysterious or provocative or suggestive there? That's, that's, that's the way that happens. Yeah. Along those lines, there's, that, there's one image, um, the radioactive spot. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one. I thought you wanted to use that as an example. Uh, yeah. This is, you know, talk about the technical side. Yeah. Um, okay, so this photograph is made in uh, Prescott, Arizona. Um, that's a little town you may recall that lost a team of uh, hotshot firefighters. Uh, forest fire uh, uh, a year ago, about a year, a year and a half ago. And uh, there is this very interesting uh, set of granite formations that are there. Uh, they're gray, unlike most of the rock in the region, which is kind of red rock. Uh, and this was an old uh, army uh, site, which was used for some experimental communication back in the 40s and 50s. It's since been decommissioned, and so what they did with it is they turned this place into a lake. Um, as a recreational lake, what a wonderful place to go, uh, peaceful. This is actually two exposures. Uh, I photographed the bottom half of the scene, uh, and then I moved the camera up and photographed the top half of the scene, and then in the software, uh, joined them together. Uh, that way I could get a great deal of resolution in the image, and for lots of technical reasons I'll look forward to it. It allows you to see far greater detail, especially in the printed version uh, of the image. So again, um, is there work happening on the computer? Absolutely. Uh, is there manipulation of the images? Absolutely. Um, but photographs are not duplications of reality. That's one of the things that I talk about a lot. Photographs are not merely duplications of reality. They're interpretations of reality. Where I choose to set the boundaries of the, of the frame, how I choose to render the dark and light tones, uh, what I choose to accentuate in the exposure, uh, how I choose to process the image, all of that is an interpretive act uh, that, that you see that especially in black and white images where the color has been removed. It's a kind of abstraction uh, that's focusing, focusing you on texture, line, and form uh, rather than trying to make you think that this is a duplication of what I saw. So again, the, the manipulation of the images for me is very much trying to make that in service of creating vision. I speak to me theologically. But one of the things that when I teach photography at church sometimes, I give students the assignment of going out to do their first photograph, and I tell them, I want you to photograph whatever you experience as powerful, right? And inevitably, a few of them come back, and they have tried to photograph things which they think justify having a photography class offered in church. And so I had one woman, a wonderful woman, well-intentioned, went out to Shelby Barnes, and she found a couple of fence posts that had fallen apart, had been nailed back together, and they happened to be in the shape of a cross. <laughs> She photographed this thing and brought it back and said, this is my example of Christian art. And I said, I, I'm trying to be diplomatic, I said, well, that's, that's a nice first try. Um, but I'm, I'm asking for something a little subtler than that. Uh, as there's nothing religious in the subject matter here, right? Um, I think what moves me in this photograph, and you'll see it as a theme of my art, is the power of texture, line, and curve. I think when we experience texture, line, and curve, it has a deep kind of affective resonance in us as human beings. And we sense, I have a little excerpt I can read on this, um, I think we sense that the world is an ordered place when we experience line and texture and curve and beauty. 
that the world isn't just a thrown together hodgepodge mishmash of chance occurrences. And we have a deep kind of affective response as human beings to that sense of balance and symmetry and order and texture coming together in an image or in a scene. Uh, and I think it's there that it, it evokes or awakens a sense that the world is right. That this world is right the way it is made. It's not some cosmic accident. This is a right place as God intends it. And while there is suffering and pain in the world, those things are in some sense parasitic on a more basic religious truth. That this world and all of its materiality is fundamentally good. So a sense of rightness about the world, and that secondly, I think for me, awakens a sense of what I call the sense of well-being. That, that whoever, whatever, we're going to use theological vocabulary, the God who brings this world into being, has created a place in this world for us to flourish. We're not the center or the measure of everything, but there is still a place for us as witness bearers and observers to beauty that that is hospitable to my life and the sense that the cosmos is at some level on my side. That it's not a hostile place uh, that's trying to snuff out my life. And I think those are both two very powerful spiritual experiences. Um, this world is good, it's as it should be, and that there's a place carved out, however small, for me to flourish and to be fully human in connection to the rest of it and to God. The first word of God is the goodness of creation, God's intention for the flourishing of all creatures. And I think as an important lesson, when we start our spiritual journey in the place of pain and suffering, we're not starting it where the gospel does. The gospel starts the story in, in, in the place of creation. And pain and suffering are in some sense understood as distortions of that. Um, and we have that basic sense that, that the pain and suffering isn't the norm. I think one of the functions of art is to, is to awaken in us that kind of primordial sense that the universe is, in fact, friendly to us and is expressive of God's purposes and order before it becomes a place of human brokenness. Mark? Uh, question When you use see a scene, do you see the holy in the scene and then try to capture it in the photograph, or do you take a photograph and then see the holy in the photograph? Yeah. If you've had me for class, you probably know that I tend to be a very linear thinker, right? Three points, boom, 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 I emphasize logical sequence. One of the, the places where I get to break out of that way of being in the world is in the arts, is in photography. Because the creative process is, I think, necessarily never linear. There are no straight lines in nature, <laughs> usually, right? And, and so, yeah, when I go out with a camera, I don't set out to, to, to impose a set of beliefs on what I see. I go out, sometimes I do, and it can be a very frustrating experience because reality is not fitting my boxes, right? Um, Aaron Siskin, the great photographer, says, um, the first act that you must do is learn to relax your beliefs. Relax your beliefs. So that while you go out there with certain kind of hopes and expectations and anticipations, you're still cultivating a sensibility open to the surprise, to receptivity, to lingering in whatever gift will be given to you by God in and through this experience. Right? Before, and I, but never with a moon. And they were, I was, they were good photographs, but they seemed a little pedestrian. And I was there, and I was surprised as this moon came up, this beautiful moon. I'm sitting here watching this happen. You know. I knew right away this is going to be a great photograph, because it's, it's the one piece that's been missing, right? But there's also a sense in which when you're making a photograph, when you do it a lot, it becomes habitual and second nature. I'm not thinking, you know, what's the theological meaning of the moonrise as it happens. I'm experiencing the moonrise. It's kind of like worship. When you worship, you're not engaged in kind of theological critique and assessment. And I have to go out there with a kind of receptivity and openness, relaxing my beliefs about what to find. But also, once you're there, the creative act start, takes over and it becomes a kind of reciprocal interplay between the gift given and the appreciation expressed through the making of the image. And it's very much is a kind of dialectical, messy, but delightful tangle uh, in the process.
taking a picture. Yeah. And let me see if I can ask this right. You, you think you've got one image, mm -hmm. but then when you go back later, do you find that you may have something you didn't even expect? Yes, let me show you one of the examples. Down in, uh, this is in 2013, down in uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi, at the Juke Joint Festival. And uh, this gentleman is, is a maker of handmade uh, jewelry. And I watched him for a while. And I have a, a post on my blog, which uh, I can, I'll, I'll not read the whole thing, I'll just summarize it. Um, some little surprises. So I'm photographing this, you know, and immediately, like, I watch him, and there is a kind of curious irony here. Here's a man who makes handmade jewelry, but he has only one hand, right? And he has this prosthetic device on his left hand. And what I learned from a, a good friend of mine that was with us on this outing was that this prosthetic device is very dated. It's how, I mean, there are much better, more aesthetically pleasing artificial limbs nowadays. And so the question I had was, why doesn't he have one? Perhaps it's a financial limitation. But she said it's probably more likely the fact that these older prosthetic devices allow him far greater strength than the more aesthetically pleasing ones. The pleasing ones, they have much greater dexterity with that particular device on his prosthetic. And as somebody who works in fine metals and, and jewelry, it probably gives him the kind of level of dexterity that he might not otherwise have if he had a different prosthetic arm. Um, and I talked in the blog um, about this photograph because what immediately struck me in response to your question was, that, well, it was this kind of irony and then, of course, I cut off the age of handcrafted, which is also a kind of echoing feature between the missing hand and the missing age of handcrafted, kind of a, a bit of a, uh, visual rhyming, if you will, going on there. Uh, but what I did not see when I made the he is holding a binder clip, and he's pinching the binder clip, which is, in some sense, kind of mimicking the pinching function of the prosthetic device. And I didn't see that when I made the photograph. And only when I got it on the computer later uh, was it this wonderful little surprise where you have this kind of playful thing going on between even his natural hand kind of retreats into a mechanical device. He's pinching this little clip um, in a way I think it's kind of interesting interplay. Um, and I think photography very often works upon those little those little rhymes, sometimes seen, sometimes that are happenstance, sometimes that are there when it didn't make the photograph. I talk about in the blog discussion of this photograph. Um, photographs are like poems, in that a poet is somebody who works and works and works to eliminate from the, from the sentences everything that is extraneous. Photographers and poets create in the same way. We create by subtraction, by removing from the scene everything extraneous. And that's very different than many other art forms, where a painter applies paint to a canvas or a sculptor, um, has much greater latitude in adding things. Photographers create by subtraction. And like poems, we're trying to concentrate meaning in the fewest possible visual elements that we can, removing from the scene everything that will distract. Like, like poetry, we like rhyme. Uh, here, there are certain kind of visual rhyming. I talked about the missing H and the missing hand, the echoing between the binder clip and his, the end of his prosthetic device. Um, uh, and then the other kind of cute irony is that while his prosthesis it, it is intended to mimic the color of his skin, he's actually inked up by way of tattoo his other arm, which is completely not natural looking. So it's this very interesting kind of play going on. And the more I look at the image, you, you can talk about those kind of playful, rhyming elements of the image. But there's also a sense in which, when I think about this image, photographers with a camera in our hand also are using a kind of prosthetic for seeing, right? That this instrument, this machine, is my way of seeing and recording in a way that my natural eye can't. So it's this kind of interesting identification I have with him. And just as he requires this machine to create, there's a sense in which the photographer does too. And it both limits and also opens up creative possibilities. Um, and for me, this, this kind of was the, one of the iconic images of the theme of broken beauty, uh, which is one of the themes in the show, uh, that beauty doesn't always reflect God's perfect, untouched design for things. It often does. But also, we find beauty in brokenness, beauty in the places of the tragic, the partial, 
um, and somehow uh, this man squeezes beauty out of whatever source of tragedy cost him his arm. Uh, and that's a deep spiritual insight, I think, for all of us. Uh, that so often uh, we want faith and grace and the spiritual life to bypass suffering and beauty and brokenness. But in fact, in the story of the gospel, uh, the gospel story is it's that God's beauty and grace travel through the tragic and through the broken quite often in our lives. And, uh, this is a very powerful experience to see this man making beauty out of the brokenness. A form of proper relatedness that when the, the elements of a thing can all be in a frame, but they're not beautiful unless they're brought together in a harmonious way. And in one of the books that I wrote many years ago, I give the example of a child who gets into the kitchen cabinets, pulls out the kitchen pans, and drops them from the counter, and they clang on the floor. And the parent comes in and says, I'm so proud of my son, my daughter. Uh, did you hear all those wonderful notes? Those are the same notes that Mozart hits. Right? And it's true. Many of the same notes from the pans clanging on the floor are the same notes that Mozart uses. But what's the difference? Mozart arranged them properly so that they formed kind of a fitting interconnection between the pattern and harmony and rhythm. All the pieces are there in the clanging of the pots and the pans, but it's in bringing them together in this kind of fitted, harmonious, properly related way that beauty emerges. I have a blog post also in which I talk about the difference between beauty and what's pretty. Uh, I think that's very important uh, because so often in our culture we confuse what's beautiful with what's pretty. Uh, what's pretty is usually what pleases us on first glance. Uh, and it usually involves ornamentation, often artificial in nature, um, uh, trying to embellish what is natural and what's artificial to convince ourselves that it's worth something. Um, I think consumerism thrives on the pretty. And one of the effects of experiencing pretty things instead of beautiful things is that pretty things don't change us. Beautiful things do. You can't stand before something beautiful, linger, and run your finger over the edge of beauty and not be transformed by what you just saw. Um, I think beauty is not just about proper relatedness, but it also has a transformative effect experientially in ways that the pretty does. It. And last, I'll just add that I think that much modern art is deeply suspicious of the language of beauty right now. Uh, that, that the idea is that beauty is just whatever your particular social group calls beauty, whatever pleasing to you. I actually, I guess I'm an old Platonist, I think that beauty is actually objectively real. That beauty is, that, that our world is structured by God, beautifully. And that beauty just isn't in the eye of the beholder. The pretty may be in the eye of the beholder, but the beautiful isn't. When we touch beauty, we're talking about the, the I think, the metaphysical underpinnings creation itself, mm -hmm. which ultimately, I think, reflect the beauty in terms of God's own triune life, which is proper relatedness, kind of perfectly expressed, I think. Oh, back, yes, please. Uh, when you photograph those individuals that are in, in these particular photographs here, mm -hmm. and in other cases as well, yeah. did you photograph to focus on the individuals as humanity, or do you focus upon them as the holy creations of God? I guess I wouldn't make a distinction between those things. Um, and I guess part of the, and I, I say that because for me, one of the functions of the arts, it, it's that place where theology gets traction experientially. And so when I look at this little boy on this bull, right, he lost in absolute bliss that he is on this mechanical bull. And he is completely absorbed by this. Am I seeing a little boy having fun with a bull, or am I seeing a holy creation of image bearer of God? The answer is yes. It's not either or. Because I can't, the only way I can experience a holy created image bearer of God is in this little boy, or in this guy. For me, I, to try to, to, to speak abstractly, theologically, is helpful up to a point, but, but as 
as an artist, as a photographer, this is the fullest expression of that theological idea, uh, as this man is, right? It's in their particularity that you, you meet their humanity, but you also meet the mystery and wonder of the image bearer of God. Uh, and for me, it's inseparable from, from the individual human person or the individual scene that I see. Wait, in the back. So, um, what, what drew you to Clarksdale? <laughs> it's close. <laughs> uh, well, I think two things. It's a great history, though. Yeah, it's a great yeah. history. It, I mean, there's some pragmatic things. I mean, you can do a day trip down to, to the, the Juke Drum Festival. Um, and as, as uh, Tiffany indicated when I opened, um, I'm from the West. I'm a Californian. Okay? And so my photographic sensibilities were kind of cultivated in the West Coast photographic tradition of Ansel Adams and Imogene Cunningham, and great big black and white landscapes of Yosemite, which you all know from Ansel Adams. And that was, I grew up there. That was the photograph, those were the photographs that I saw that shaped my creative and aesthetic kind of sensibilities. So that's where I began. And so you'll see in a lot of my work that that's still very much continues, the first floor of Founders Hall. But as I've grown as a photographer, I've become more interested in people. Um, people used to, a friend used to come to my show, shows and says, you never photograph people. I said, I don't find it interesting. I just I find the landscape more interesting than people. And this has changed in the last five years. I think it's part of my own kind of spiritual journey and photographic journey to realize that the human world and the natural world, as much as I would like to keep them apart, um, isn't going to work. And um, coming to the Mid-South um, from the West, ultimately, um, meant I had to find a way of being present in this land, in a culture with its own musical traditions, with its own racial history and the struggles of race that are part of the Mid-South that weren't played out in the same way in California. And so it was the bluesman uh, which became that place for me where I see all of the contradictions, also all of the beauty, but also all the suffering converging uh, culturally and artistically. Uh, and it's the musicians which increasingly draw my attention. Uh, often the uh, male musicians more than female musicians. There are more of them that do blues than, than women, but there are some women who do. And I think that's connected up with an interest that I have in gender studies and how men are performing an identity um, but when they, men like him enter into their artistic identity, there can be a loosening up of our expectations of masculinity that allows this guy to suddenly look a whole lot like this guy. Yeah. I put them together in the exhibit for a reason. And in some ways, men in our society are not permitted to do this. Children are, right? To smile, to lose oneself, to not be in control. And quite often, by the time we boys become men, that's been kind of beaten out of us. Mm -hmm. And that our, we're restricted in what it means to be a man because we have internalized all kinds of policing mechanisms that our society places upon us, just as it does for women. Femininity does that for men, too. And with the blues players, I always see these men breaking out of those kind of straight-jacketed identities through the creative process, they discover and get in touch with and express, I think, certain dimensions of their humanity which they're not normally allowed to express as men, especially black men, let's face it, in the South. Um, and that, that very much uh, interests me. And along those same lines, this image uh, was one that I, was one of my favorites from the, from the show. These guys had just finished performing and had stepped off stage and were kind of recovering. And I moved into position, and I don't photograph with telephoto lenses for the most part. I don't, I don't like working with them. Uh, it allows me then to be a voyeur, whereas if I have a shorter lens, I have to be close. And that forces a kind of uh, participation in the scene. Um, and so I had to work very slowly to get up to these guys. And they, I watched them for about 20 minutes, waiting, and I made several exposures. And, and again, they were good exposures, but nothing special. And then suddenly the man sitting higher reached over and put his hand on the shoulder of his old friend. At that moment I knew I had the image. What grabbed me was very often in our society men are not allowed to express physical intimacy with one another. It's part of the code. 
It's, it's rooted in what it means to be a man. If men express too much physical intimacy to one another, we get very anxious, and our kind of homophobia can kick in, or, or, or we feel threatened. Uh, if a man touches another man in ways that uh, make us uncomfortable, there are these very interesting spaces where we allow this code of masculinity to be broken. One of them is on the athletic field. <laughs> Where are we slapping one another on the football field? <laughs> That's about the only place you can do that, right? But the arts are another place that allow these two older men, who probably have been raised in the same straitjacket of masculinity that I have and others have, where it, there's a kind of relaxation of that in this moment. It's a very intimate moment between these guys. Um, perfectly relaxed, perfectly comfortable with one another. And I don't know if that's something that comes with age, or if it's also something that comes with the arts, uh, having opened them and made them receptive to a new identity. And if you want to talk about theological themes, there's one. How does participation in the arts open the imagination to allow us to imagine ourselves and to perform our identities differently as a people of faith? Um, and this image for me very much kind of evoke those questions about my own masculinity and how I perform it and how it's straight-jacketed in many ways and how there are these little places in photography or for these guys in music, how they can kind of break out those straight-jackets and be more fully and authentically human together. Um, one of the dangers of photography as an art form is that you can go at it to go out and take pictures capture pictures, um, shoot. You'll notice that I don't tend to use that language. I talk about making photographs, not taking them. I talk about making a photograph, not shooting. The images are aggressive, to paint, to capture, and to shoot. And there's a way that I think many photographers go out as though they're in stealth mode to sneak a picture of somebody. And it can be a kind of... Um, aggressive, if not a violent gesture, that I can walk up to somebody, perhaps in a moment of vulnerability, snap a picture, get my souvenir, and walk away without really having had some kind of human interaction that honors their, their humanity. That's one of the reasons I want to use shorter lenses, is that I can't snipe from 50 yards away, that I actually have to be present. And while I often don't talk to folks, I stand in a position, and I, I don't hide the camera, and, and usually I'll make eye contact and smile, and, and I indicate I've got a camera, and you can read body language, right? And this guy didn't have any problem. He, he didn't turn away from the camera, didn't shake his head no, didn't, didn't exhibit any kind of nervousness. And so there's a kind of tacit permission that can happen in that way. But there's sometimes when I get into a position that a person just doesn't want to be photographed, and I try to honor that. I just, there's plenty of other people I can photograph. This person doesn't want to participate in the creative act for reasons that are wholly his or her own, and I honor that. Um, I'm not interested in taking pictures of people who, who would experience that as an, in an aggressive way. So, so often I try to form a human connection, um, but there's also a sense in which I want to honor his otherness, and I think walking up to him and saying, hey buddy, how'd you lose your arm? It's not exactly how to win friends and look at people. Um, I think if I came to know him, over a long period of time, and we had a, a, a friendship that would form, and if he should choose to reveal that, or our friendship could become rich enough such that I might ask it, I might ask at that time. But usually in the field, um, um, the, the level of, of friendship isn't there yet. I mean, you, you're on friendly terms, hopefully, but, but not a deep enough level that, that I could ask him, how did you get the wound that defines you in profound ways? It just our relationship wasn't there, right? Um, but I did make sure that he saw me with a camera, that, that I also, my facial features say, I'm not just shooting you because you're a freak, right? You're not a freak, but I'm interested in you, I'm interested in you as an artist. I'm interested in this kind of integration of your life into these pieces of jewelry. Um, and, and so I didn't, I didn't want to photograph him outside of the context of his jewelry. And that was a way of kind of honoring that he is more than just a guy with a prosthetic arm. He's an artist who happens to have a prosthetic arm, uh, which modifies his identity as an artist. 
walk with me in this question because it's going to be maybe kind of hard. It occurs to me that this kind of thoughtfulness, um, this ability to go out to, to make these photographs, is something that we can do because we have a privilege in terms of class. Um, that, at the same time, I see you choose to um, make photographs that speak to perhaps a loss of privilege or a regaining of privilege. Um, why race, class, ableism, etc. Can you speak to that? Is there something that, that you found in your work that kind of speaks to that? I don't know if I'm asking that well. Well, photography is not a cheap art form. Right. These lenses, these cameras require quite an investment. And so, yes, there is a, a, a all art, but certainly the kinds that require expensive resources, does come with a kind of class status and class privilege, of which I am aware. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, the best photographs and the best photographic experiences I have are when the camera becomes a way for me to enter empathetically into the life of another, even if just for a brief moment, right. and to delight in the life of this other. I was photographing down on Beale Street um, last spring, and there was a homeless man, uh, you know, and if you're out in, in Memphis, you, these homeless folks are out, and, and, and you know, you can expect to be panhandled in that area of town. You know, I've been down there often enough that I can see it coming a mile away, you know, the, the artificial friendliness, and the, you, you can tell they're working it up, you know. And, and I knew it was coming. He saw me with the camera, so he thought it was a tourist, and you know, I was going to fall for the shtick, you know. And um, I let him come up to me, and, and um, he went and started talking about making photographs. And, um, and I'm kind of like, okay, when are we going to get, when are we going to get the ask? It's coming in the next two minutes for the ask, you know. And he never did. And, um, so I, so I, I was in a moment of conversion. I said, would you allow me to pay you to make your photograph? And it was this really interesting inversion. I didn't make him ask. You know. And he had this he was very interesting face. And he allowed me to take a photograph of him. And I gave him a few bucks. You know, and shook hands and talked a little bit about uh, politics that day. And we moved on. But it was an interesting moment. I mean, because. As I saw him approaching, all of my defensiveness of how I just, I hate to be panhandled. As much as I'm sympathetic to the homeless, there's something about that act that still for me feels kind of dirty. I don't like that, you know, it just, it, it feels a little bit awkward. You know? But how I choose to respond to that in this moment is I could have shut down, I could have just, no, not even said no, just shook my head, move on. Um, but with the camera, it, it transformed the encounter uh, so that it became something where I was able to move beyond my own awkwardness and fear and engage him as a human being, not just a homeless guy. Uh, and not put him in a position of having to ask for that. Yeah, I think there's a fine line between artistic um, and trying to make a statement about people who are experiencing homelessness yeah. and exploitation of the same. Yeah, it's, it, it's a fine line because I think in art, um, we have to be very careful with propaganda. That if, a, if an image is, if I go out to make a photograph to, so that I'm advancing the cause of homeless people, or if I go out to make landscape photographs to advance the cause of ecological awareness, if there is a quid pro quo quality, it's not art, it's propaganda. Yeah. And we all, you know, sense that, that good art, when it's not propaganda, has multiple layers of meaning and ambiguity in an image that that unsettles that one-to-one -one correlation between intention and meaning. And that it, it's an invitation into a scene or a, a, a moment of encounter um, that renders both you and the person or the subject that you're photographing richer and more dimensional sometimes let things be. Uh, and, and as far as technical, I don't know if other people are interested in this, but I find it fascinating. So these are not pure black and white. Will you talk a little bit about yeah. the tricolor? Yeah. Um, most of my photography is digital. Um, I came to the medium when film was on its way out. I do a little bit of medium format film work. That's very rare. Most of my stuff is digital. I photograph in color. 
and then convert to black and white. Because the reason I do that is that you're then capable of taking each color, red, green, yellow, and blue, and you can render how dark or light that tone is separately from the others. So it gives you a great deal of creative control over which, which colors in a scene will be light, mid-tones, or shadows, right? So the photographs are converted to black and white. Uh, when, but I'm aware that when I'm going out to photograph in color, I'm actually pre-visualizing, as Anselm said. I'm visualizing, I want a black and white print at the end of this process. How do I have to photograph this scene in color? to get me the raw negative that I can manipulate into that final image, right? So, um, so these are converted to black and white. You asked about the split tone. Um, straight black and white photography is just that. It's black and white and shades of gray in between. Um, there's old techniques that go back, you know, to the beginning of photography, where we realize that sometimes harsh black and gray isn't the most suitable aesthetic that if, if the grays were a little warmer, a little bit of brown in there, and so I tint the images, I add a little bit of what you might call sepia or a brown tone uh, to the image, but I don't add it to everything in the image. Um, it's, I add it only to the shadows and to the mid-tones, and on the whites, I leave them pure white, so they don't look dingy, right? So the whites of this, back of this, this, and the piano, or whatever this is, pretty white, his shirt is pretty white, but if you look carefully at the mid-tones and the shadows in the image, they have a kind of a warmer brown hue to them. I find that that warms up the image, especially with, with people images, that um, I find it just a little more flattering. Um, so they're split-toned. They're toned, but toned only in the shadows and mid-tones, not the highlights. I'm um, the, there's a picture of one of the, I think it's a Trappers or stalkers. Sometimes we set up in a place that you know is great, and then you wait for actors to enter the stage. That's one technique we use. The other technique we use is stalking. And so this gentleman uh, is, you probably can't see it uh, on the screen, but his little tag here says president. He's the president of this little biker group. And I watched it for a while, and it's a biker group of four guys. Three of his sons and him. <laughs> And, and I watched him, and he, they, had, they were treating him really well. He's obviously quite old, and they had to kind of lead him around. And he got tired, so they put him in the back of the, sit on the back of his trailer, right by a crawfish booth. And they were going to go buy him some crawfish to eat. And he sat down, and he, he, he knew I was there. I mean, I was probably 20 feet from him. Um, and it was like he knew I was there, and he almost wanted to pose for this portrait. <laughs> and he, he just planted that cane and kind of looked off into the light, and I'm like, he's just saying, take this picture, which I did. Um, and, and again, it's this very interesting moment where, where he's adorned with all of his biker regalia and his buttons and all of it, uh, but the president, you know, but this, this, he's the president of something, by golly, even if it's only got four members in this nation, he's the president. And uh, it was just, for me, it was just celebration of the human need to belong, the human need to be validated and valued. Um, and my photograph was one more pin on his, you know, on his uh, vest, kind of. It was one more validation of who he was. And, and that was a, a kind of a rich moment to be able to do that. But it's the journey of seeing that gets you that final image. I mean, you look at Dorothea Lange's migrant mother. She made five or six photos as she walked up before she got it right. 
and photography is often like that. There's a trial there. White for me is a good. Black and white accentuates line, texture, and form. When you remove color from the scene, you're left with the elemental, basic, structural, formal dimensions of the thing. And that for me is, I think, um, what's powerful aesthetically.